So 12 years ago, I was a poker dealer. And I got laid off from the casino right before my second child was born, my son. And in America at the time, you didn't get to have health care uh, if you didn't work for a major corporation. I hope that that rests in peace forever. Um, so I went off to go and become a software engineer, as one does. And I moved to Bend, Oregon. Yeah, Bend, right? And I saw someone in the back here wearing a shirt from a conference called Ruby on Ales. Did anyone go to Ruby on Ales? You know this conference? There are my people right here. There are not enough of us. We may someday have a revival. Um, but I met this one guy at my very first Ruby conference before I could program uh, and before I had ever spoken at a conference. And it was Ruby on Ales, and I met Aaron Patterson. And about half of you have been to one of these before, if uh, history serves. So uh, some of you may not know who this man is, but Aaron has been a Rubyist for far longer than I've known him, and I've known him for at least 10 years. Uh, after meeting Aaron, I, after many false starts in software over the years, finally became a Rubyist, and he is a very large part of why. He embodies exactly the values that represent our community. He consistently contributes positive energy to all of us and <laughs> fantastic puns on the internet that are not so fantastic. I've heard them in Japanese, they're worse. Um, <laughs> he is exactly the kind of person that made me want to become a Rubyist. And so then I set about uh, learning to write some Ruby and actually speaking at conferences. Um, so Aaron is a, a reason that I am here, and I suspect that is true for many of you. He goes by Tenderlove <laughs> on the internet. And if you go to twitter.com slash Tenderlove, you too can be Aaron's friend. Um, a round of applause for our closing talk titled End of the Day Keynote by Aaron Patterson. Hello? Okay, it's not, geez. <laughs> if I had known I was gonna get that kind of intro, I don't think I would have agreed to give a talk here. <laughs> um, wow, wow, I don't know how to follow that. I th thank you so much, Donan, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm very, very nervous right now. Um, it is RailsConf 2022, and it has been a minute. Uh, I'm your host for this presentation. My name is Aaron Patterson. Uh, I am excited to be here in Portland. How many of you here are from Portland? That's awesome. That's really great. Uh, I'm, I'm from Seattle, and I know that a lot of people think that Portland is basically like a mini Seattle, and that's just not, like, it's not true. I don't think that's really fair to Portland. Uh, the Starbucks here tastes way better than the Starbucks in Seattle, so really think that's, I really think that's not fair. Also, Portland has, like, Portland has a lot of really um, nice boutique hotels, and I enjoy that. I'm actually staying at one for the conference. It's the Double Tree by... <laughs> Hilton, uh, <laughs> really fancy. Uh, you can tell because of the little thing over the E. Um, <laughs> uh, whenever I come to Portland, I really enjoy like really enjoy supporting the local businesses like Nike and Intel. Just so, so really really great. But honestly, this time I wanted to support like more mom and pop businesses. So I, I really like recommend that folks check out the old Spaghetti Factory. <laughs> And <laughs> sorry, Portland. Sorry, Portland people. <laughs> uh, also, I mean, you know, Starbucks is really great, but I, I, I really recommend that you stop by and get a local cup at the Dutch Bros. <laughs> I mean, Portland is basically a small Seattle, so I feel like I'm qualified to give you, give you local recommendations. Check out, I really, really recommend the Dutch Bros that's on the corner of um, Couch and Glisten Street. <laughs> the Portland people here are so mad at me right now. <laughs> Uh, but really, like I, one one thing I think is fun is that you should you should find my my brick and mortar store. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. 
Uh, it's been three years. It has been three years since we've had a RailsConf in person. Please, let's have, we made it. We're here three years. And, and since this is our first, like our first RailsConf and in-person RailsConf in three years, I would like, oh. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I'm wearing green screen gloves. Did anybody, no, did anybody notice that? So, so I wanted to explain the reason I'm wearing green screen gloves is I know that we're gonna be, we're gonna be streaming this online later this year, and I figured like if I'm, if I'm too boring or something, we can like fix it in post, like maybe put some, <laughs> put some wings on me or something like that, make it a little bit more interesting. Anyway, it's been three years and I really wanna do, like I wanna do a Friday hug today, so I, I'm gonna get my camera ready and let's do, like let's do this. We are going to do a Friday hug. And this, like, oh, okay, everybody ready for a Friday hug? This year, this year I, want to, I want to dedicate this Friday hug to the developers in Ukraine. So please, everybody, let's have a Friday hug. Ah, happy Friday! Yeah. Okay, I will tweet these. Thank you. Woo! Yes, Friday! I know, I know some of you are probably, some of you out there are probably saying, but Aaron, it's not Friday. And the thing is, it's always Friday somewhere. <laughs> it is. So I, I wanna talk about the things that have happened to me over the past three years. Uh, I, started a, I started a job at Shopify. Actually, I've been at Shopify for two years now, which is like blowing my mind. It's like, wow. It, it has been a long time since we've been together in person. Uh, but anyway, you could say, you could say that uh, Shopify is my active job. Um, <laughs> I've had that one in the queue for quite a while. <laughs> Probably should upgrade to Sidekick or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is a... This is my, this is m many of the folks on my team at Shopify. We had a meeting, we met up in London a little, a few weeks ago, and this is, these are many of the folks, but not everybody. Uh, also, I have some, I have some sad news over the past year. Um, my little buddy Gorby passed away, so uh, this is a photo of him doing what cats do best, which is sleeping on my computer. Uh, <laughs> which was a very nice thing of him to do. So after he passed, I wanted to put together like a, a, a compila compilation of all of his photos. And unfortunately, like, it turns out you can only add 5,000 photos to a shared, like, to a shared album. But uh, Evie and I, like, we, we took a look at all the photos we had, and it, we, I, I calculated, it turns out that uh, we had taken five photos of him on average per day for his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> which made which made me laugh. So uh, at least I have I have most of his life documented. Uh, but our our other cat, our more shy and less famous cat, SeaTac, is still she's going pretty well. I'm trying to like get her to pose with the mini hands. <laughs> Not working too well. It's kind of a struggle. She doesn't seem to care. Uh, I've also been making cheese. This is a camembert that I made. It is very very good. But my cheese making fun has left our house a little bit funky at times. Uh, I got it. I made a new headshot because uh, I mean, when you, when you're like stuck at home for three years, you gotta you gotta like entertain yourself somehow, right? Um, I I bought a green screen, uh, and this is so that I could better produce like online, do online conferences and stuff. And I really enjoyed messing with the green screen, but unfortunately, this thing like this green screen cost me like three hundred bucks. So I'm trying to use it as frequently as possible so that I can like amortize, like get the cost down, you know what I mean? So I decided to start like an online stream. So I've been doing, I've been doing like online, I'm, I'm turning into a YouTuber, na YouTuber now and you can like, you can come, like please come check out my, my YouTube page, it's Tender Love is Cool Stuff. Make sure to like, subscribe and like smash that bell. <laughs> I mean, I don't, so I don't want to boast or anything, but my channel has like tens of subscribers. I'm really blown up here. It's, it's really great. If you Google for my live stream, I'm on the second page. It's so good. <laughs> um, last December, <laughs> this one's not fun. Last December, I got COVID. It sucked. I do not recommend anybody to get it. Zero stars. 
do not recommend. It was awful. <laughs> All right, so let's, I guess let's talk about some of the stuff that my team does at work. I want to talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, I think our, our like purvey or the thing that we're responsible for is essentially just speeding up uh, Ruby and Rails. And one of the projects that we've been working on is a project called YJIT, which is a JIT compiler for Ruby. And it's shipped in Ruby 3.1, so please give it a try with your applications. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this project so much, but I just wanted to mention it. So try it out when you install Ruby 3.1. I do want to talk about uh, JITs for a second, though. Uh, JITs, like, all a JIT is is something that can generate machine code at runtime. That's all it is. It's just figuring out how to generate machine code at runtime. And, like, if you think about machine code, machine code is really just a sequence of bytes, okay? It's just a sequence of bytes, and anything that can put together a sequence of bytes can be used to make a JIT compiler. And in fact, like Ruby can put together, Ruby can make a sequence of bytes. That's a thing that we can do in Ruby. Uh, so that made me think, like during this pandemic, it made me think, could I write a pure Ruby JIT? Is it possible to write a pure Ruby JIT? And the answer is yes, yes, we actually can write a pure Ruby JIT. So that's one of the things that I've been working on over this uh, I guess break, I don't know. I called it uh, TenderJIT, and you can go like check it out right here. This is the logo for it, but I was considering other logos. Like I was thinking like this might be good. <laughs> or, or possibly like this one also. also. <laughs> I have come up with a motto for the project though. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the thing is, I guess this, like, this actually describes probably 90% of the software projects that I really, really like to work on, this, this particular phrase. But the, thi the thing is, like, the reason is, I mean, how do I know whether or not I can do something unless I actually, like, I actually do it? So by the, time, like, by the time I get it done, then I'm like, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done this. But <laughs> it's too late now. Uh, honestly, this is actually what led me to, like, this led me to develop my hit product, the analog terminal bell, and I, like, I'm not here to sell you all on my business prowess. I gave a pitch for this product at the last RailsConf, so that's not, that's not really why I'm here right now. I've been getting, like, this, this project, product has been a huge success, I've been raking in tons of clicks, um, but I gotta tell you, I haven't sold any units yet, so, and the reason is because I'm trying to figure out if there's like some kind of website that I can use to like build an online store. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody can think of something like that, you know, please like, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> now before we dive into the professional software topics, I would actually prefer to talk to you about some uh, amateur software development with you all. And I want to bring some, like, I want to I bring this, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should energy to this conference. I, basically, I want to talk about, like, I, I've been seeing so many talks here of stuff that's so great that you should actually do in production. Like, you know, run, work on, uh, use, use, I don't know, JRuby in production, or use all the, all the different things I've been seeing, and it looks really, really good, but I want to talk about stuff you shouldn't run in production, which is this hack that I'm really super proud of, and that's what we're going to walk through. I'm very proud of it. So this year, I finally upgraded to an Apple M1, and I'm really excited about it. Love the computer. It's so good. It's so good. But there is a huge issue huge issue with it, and that is that it's an ARM processor. The Apple M1 is an ARM processor. And unfortunately, uh, both YJIT and TenderJIT are, they only work on x86 machines. And this is really good, this is really good if you're running uh, TenderJIT in production on an x86 machine, which I know many of you are. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted to set, like, I wanted to set TenderJIT apart from YJIT some way, so I thought maybe I could, like, add an ARM back, ARM back end to it. But I mean, right now, I'd have to say, like, both of these JITs are legit JITs. It's true. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted, to add, I wanted to add an ARM back end, so I developed this gem called ARCH64, which you can go check out there. ARCH64 is a gem, which is a, it's an ARM64 assembler that's written in pure Ruby. And I wrote this gem because I needed a way to generate ARM64 machine code for TenderJIT. 
Uh, but I also wrote it because I know, like, like many of you in the audience, I'm really tired of writing my Rails applications in Ruby. I actually would prefer to be writing my Rails applications in assembly in Ruby. <laughs> right? Makes sense. So here's an example. You don't need to read, like, I'm sure it's not readable. You don't need to read it too closely. But basically what it does, this, this code example, all it does is it uh, returns some number. Uh, it, it assembles machine code that returns a number, and that number happens to be in Hex Food Cafe. And uh, if, you, if we zoom in on the, on the actual machine code, this is the actual part where it's writing out machine code. Uh, this just puts a number into a register and then returns, returns that value. So it's putting food cafe into the X0 register and returning it. And this machine, um, this isn't the thing I wanted to talk about though. Like, the, yes, we are writing machine code in Ruby and then executing it, but I honestly feel like this just, like, it's not amateur enough. Like, <laughs> I really, like, I really want to express that this needs to be something you shouldn't be doing, and that, that seems fine. I'm, I have no problems with that. I need to do something that's extremely amateur, like something so bad that we look back and we're like, ah, oh, yes, actually, that's great. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is some of the supporting code, specifically this line right here, which I'll zoom in on a little bit later. Uh, this line it says, just says jitbuffer.new, and uh, the JIT buffer is an object that I made, it's a library that I put together that provides us with executable memory. When you're JITting an application or you're just writing this machine code at runtime, you have to have some executable memory to put that code into. So you have to put it in memory that's tagged as executable and then you're able to execute it. And I wanted a generic interface for managing this type of executable, executable code and thus the JIT buffer gem was born. This, this gem is cross-platform, it works on Linux and Mac OS, and this wasn't a big deal. We could just, all I had to do is swap out a few system calls and it works fine. Uh, the other thing is it, it works on any platform. We can use this on x86 machines or ARM machines, power PCs, whatever you want to. It works on any of them, because all it's doing is managing this executable memory. Now, of course, I had to write tests for this thing. Like, I wanted to test this code. So here we have like, we have some, this is an example of using the JIT buffer. We just create a new buffer, say it's writable, we write some uh, instructions out to it and then we actually call into it. But we needed to, I wanted to be able to test this on both the ARM platform and the x86 platform. I wanted to test them on both platforms. So if you think about this, you're like, okay, well how would I write this test case? You know, you might write something like this where you say like, okay, if I'm on an ARM64 machine, then I'll write ARM64 bytes. Otherwise, if I'm on an x86 machine, I'll write the x86 bytes. But the thing I really don't like about this test case is like, well, how do you, you know, how do you implement this ARM64 method? Like, how do you test, how do you tell what platform you're on? Like, maybe you shell out to the arch command or you check the build parameters for your Ruby installation or you do, like, do something like that. And I, I just didn't really like that. It didn't sit really well with me. And the other thing is like, as we all know, as professional software engineers, like if statements mean complexity. If we're adding those if statements, like that, we don't want to do that. That just makes the code way too complicated. The other, the other problem is like writing these if statements is just, it's not cool, <laughs> right? Not cool. So I kept thinking to myself, like, is there a way that we can just ask the CPU, like, hey, what are you? Are you an x86? Are you an ARM? What are, what are you? And then I got to thinking, well, you know, machine code, machine code is just bytes. It's just some bytes that we put together. And then I wondered, are there, val like, are there bytes that are valid for both x86 and ARM64? Like, can I use the same bytes on two different processors? And the answer is yes. I figured out how to do this, and this is actually my, one of my best ideas ever. <laughs> and I wanna walk you all, I wanna walk you all through how it works, so buckle in a little bit, we're gonna have to read some machine code, but, but it'll be fine, I'm, I am here and we'll walk through it all together. So here's an example of some x86 machine code. This is x86 assembly language code. And we're gonna walk through each line and explain what it does. The first line, all it does is it puts the value ox2b in the racks register. And on x86 machines, whatever value is in the racks register, that's the one that you return from the current function. So this is saying, hey, we're gonna put 
OX2B in there. And then immediately after we do that, we, we, we call ret. And this says, I want to return from the function. So we're just, all we're doing in these first two lines is we're returning the value OX2B. That's it. The next line, though, is, is kind of odd. We have this jump. And this jump seems useless because we returned before we called the jump, OK? But let's pretend, that, let's pretend that the jump ran. If this jump runs, all it does is it just jumps back to foo, and then we would write to be into the racks register, and then we would call return. So let's say we take, this, we take this machine code and we run it through the assembler, and then the assembler is just gonna output some bytes, and we're gonna take a look at the bytes that the assembler would output. So here are the bytes that the assembler output, and x86 machines use a variable width encoding for their instructions, which means that uh, the, this first instruction, the move instruction, it uses seven bytes, the ret instruction uses one byte, and the jump instruction uses two bytes. And these are, I, like, I realize there are spaces in here, but they're actually all contiguous. They're, they're right next to each other. I just put holes in there, like, so you could have them on each line and read it more easily. Uh, but if we were to write this out into a Ruby array, it would look something like this. They're just right next to each other. Okay, so we have this. This is our x86 code. Next code, let's look at some ARM64 machine code. The first line, we're writing a value, this value OX7B7 to the X11 register. And we're not doing anything with it, we just write that value into the register. So the next thing that we do is we write the value OX2B into the X0 register, and on the ARM platform, whatever value is in X0, that's the one we return. So on X86, it's racks, on ARM, it's X0. And then finally we return from the function, and that's it. So let's take a look at the bytes for this. ARM64 uses a fixed width encoding. All of the, meaning all the instructions are the same width, they're all four bytes. And I left some spaces in there, and you'll see why in a minute. But those are, these are the bytes for each of the instructions. So let's look at both of them put together. So on the top here we have x86-64, and on the bottom we have ARM64 machine code. And I want you to notice something like incredibly convenient about these two blocks of hex digits. If you'll notice here, the last two bytes of the x86 code and the first two bytes of the ARM64 code, those are the same. Okay, okay. Okay, so what if we smashed these two things together like that? Like, what if we did that? <laughs> and then we told the CPU, hey, I would like you to start executing from right here. <laughs> what would happen? What would happen if we did that? I will tell you what would happen if we did that. Let's say we ran this on an x86 machine. The x86 machine is gonna interpret those first two bytes as a jump, that jump that we saw. And it's gonna execute those first two instructions, the move <laughs> and then the ret. So it'll jump up there. Now let's say we do the same thing on an ARM machine. What if we, we pointed an ARM machine at this thing? Same position. The ARM machine is just gonna write some garbage number to X11 that we really don't care about. And then it's gonna write OX2B to X0 and then return. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So both of, these, both of these code paths return the same value, OX2B. So what I did is I wrote a very, 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 a VCP, or a very cool program. <laughs> <laughs> Which is this, as we learned, we saw that table of bytes on the previous slide. I put together that table of bytes right here, and I wrote that out to the, I wrote that out to the JIT buffer, and I said, hey, I would like you to start, at, start executing at position eight. And when I do that, we call the function and it'll return OX2B regardless of whether we're on an ARM, an ARM machine or an x86 machine. So <laughs> what I want you to know about this code, it is, it is cross-platform. <laughs> there, no, there are absolutely no if statements in it, which clearly means that the complexity is zero, right? <laughs> so simple, it's so simple. <laughs> All right, so more importantly, this fits my rubric for fun programs. Now, I think, unfortunately, like, if I wrote a program like this at work, <laughs> so if I wrote a program like this at work, I think probably 
I'd say like maybe 10% of the, my coworkers would think I'm a genius, but the other 90% the other would probably hate me. <laughs> so I don't, I don't wanna write this type of code at work, but I still wanna have this type of fun because that, like, that's how I feel. I mean, uh, Xavier's opening key, keynote this morning really resonated with me because he was talking about solving problems just for the fun of it, and that's exactly what I was doing here. I mean, I'm not gonna throw this code away though. This is, this is sticking around forever. Uh, anyway, I wanna have this type of fun when I'm developing applications. And uh, to be honest, like when I'm working on Rails applications, like that's, that's the type of fun I feel, but I still get to write like production ready code, like actual, actual production ready code. All right. So we're gonna talk about Rails now. I mean, I talked about like low level CPU stuff and this is, this is RailsConf, so I feel like we should probably talk about Rails at RailsConf. <laughs> so before we do that though, I wanna look at an anatomy, the anatomy of a tender love talk. So here's you know, tender love talk timeline teardown. This is my TED talk about tender love talks. <laughs> So my, my talks usually follow a format like this, where I make jokes about local businesses, follow that up with pictures of my cat and updates about my life. Uh, then I'll show like some weird code that is really, really fun, but not necessarily related to the topic that we have at hand. Then I'll go into a main topic, talk about some things, and then finally like an abrupt ending after running out of time. Like I, <laughs> I didn't really plan too well and we gotta like move along. Now, we're actually right here. We're at this, <laughs> we're at this moment in time. Now, and the thing is, like, I don't know, I don't know if you all have noticed, but this particular section has actually been kind of like <laughs> dragging that out a little bit, right? The reason I've been dragging my feet is I want to talk about, like, I want to talk about two topics. I want to talk about new features in Rails 7, and I also want to talk about Rack. Now, I can talk about Rack all day. That's super easy. I can go on and on about that, no problem at all. But new features in Rails, like, I'm pretty worried about it. Like, I'm worried about, you know, talking about the subject. Uh, I have to say, though, like, the very first, I'm just gonna get this out here, my very first favorite feature of Rails is that spring, Rails 7 is there's no more spring. So. <laughs> That's, that's, that's like deleting code though, so it's, I mean, eh, we all like to delete code, but is it really a new feature? I don't know. So I, what I decided to do is I decided to check out this really sweet blog post that has a, a comprehensive list of all the new features in Rails 7.0. <laughs> So I tallied these together. I put them all together. This is, a, this is the whole list. This is the list of everything. Rail 7. So it made, but it made me realize that like before we could talk about all these really, these like great new features, import maps, hotwire default, Turbo 7, Stimulus 3, JS bundling, CS bundling, we, we have to address this like really giant elephant in the room. And this is really why I've been dragging my feet on this presentation. And the thing is, like, I know this is, this is gonna be extremely controversial and surprising to all of you, uh, but the fact of the matter is, I'm not a front-end developer, <laughs> and I have no idea, like, I have no idea what any of those <laughs> were. <laughs> But, but actually, it's okay. It's really, really okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay because the reason it's okay is because these tools are actually designed to make, for, for folks like me who aren't super good at front-end development, make front-end development easy, easy to use with Rails applications and easy, easy for developers like myself. And actually, I do want to talk about one of these, which is import maps and ES modules. And I am, despite the fact that I'm a back-end developer, as you may have noticed from the machine code introduction, <laughs> I'm really excited about th this feature because, <laughs> because it means that we have three different ways to include JavaScript <laughs> files in our applications. <laughs> so, yay! <laughs> I 
Actually, I, I am really excited about it, though. And I'm going to follow, like, I want to walk through an example of using import maps in a new application. So if you use, if you start a new Rails 7 application, you'll notice it, you'll notice in the application HTML, in the uh, layout, there's a new tag here, which is the JavaScript import tag. And in addition to this, in addition to this new line, oh man, we're getting into the Aaron is actually being serious part of the presentation now, I'm sorry. This is where we need to take advantage of the green screen hands, <laughs> please, <laughs> post editors. So you, you'll see this new line here. Second, we also have a new file, the config import map.rb. This just defines all the stuff that's going to be in the import map for, for the application. And if we go do, if we do a request and take a look at the source code of the application, you'll notice that there's an import map now rendered uh, with all these things. You'll see it automatically generating, generating that import map for you. And um, I want to talk about this. One of the nice things about the import maps Rails gem is that we're able to pin libraries. It's, it's able to pin libraries. And for folks like me who have no clue, I was about to drop an F-bomb there. I feel like I got to do that as a key Rails conf keynote. We're missing that. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no clue about what pinning means. Actually, what it means is just putting a thing in that hash. Like, I don't know why this is special, but it just puts a thing in the hash. So like, you run bin import map, and this is an example of putting lodash es into that, into that import map. And I'm, I'm showing an example here. This is using the, uh, the Spanish version of lodash, which you can tell because it's got the es, the es in it. You, I did tell you all that I'm a very professional and very, very good JavaScript programmer, right? Like, I know everything about JS. Anyway, this, this is just putting that, putting that uh, Lodash example or Lodash uh, JavaScript file into the import map, and you'll see it gets added to this, into this um, file down here at the bottom. And one thing I noticed is that it picks a name for you automatically. I didn't really like that. I wish you could do that on the command line, tell it a different name, because I think this is a bad name. So I just changed it myself. Uh, to that, and if you reload the refresh the page, you'll see that in fact it is in this. It's in the source map here, right here. That's great, and it's referencing referencing an external uh, external JavaScript file. We can actually use this new module super easy. Just import it and use it. And then I ran this, and I was like, okay, yes, it worked. Great, cool. I am now a front end developer. I did it. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. I need the support. So import maps, these import maps are very, very easy to use, and Rails makes them even easier, but like uh, something, there's actually something more to these things that I, that I really actually enjoy as just a developer and even a back-end developer, not necessarily a, doing front-end work at all, is that they actually use indirect names. And what I like about this is it means that we can import these modules by some particular name rather than referring to the actual asset file itself, which includes some like, hash at the end for caching, which I think is really funny. I was like researching this and I don't know, I mean, I don't know how, have you, how many of you remember Rails 2, like the 2 series? Anyone in here? Raise your hand. Wow, okay, lots of you. You remember it would throw like the timestamp on the end after the question mark? Yeah, I remember that, but it turned out that that like doesn't work at all. <laughs> so it turns out like instead we have to put the the, the, the hash into the file name itself is like, who's the, why is this so broken? Why did, really? We can't figure out something better? Anyway, so we have the hash in the name of the file, and what's nice about these, these import maps is that we can use the files without re referring to that hash. So we're able to refer to the keys rather than the values themselves. What else is interesting about this is that if we're using import maps, we're not actually bundling JavaScript anymore because uh, we're referring to these particular JavaScript files. And I think that people can see this as a problem. But actually, it turns out that we get better caching with this because if we ever have to break one of those files, the web, uh, the web browser can just download the one that broke rather than downloading all of our JavaScript that's put together. Now, unfortunately, this causes a problem. It means that we're having more requests, like there's going to be more requests to our server. Now, this isn't really a problem if you're using HTTP2, though, because HTTP2 uh, can perform concurrent parallel requests on a single socket. And this is actually my perfect excuse to quit stopping, quit talking about front end stuff <laughs> and move on to talking about rack. <sighs> I made it. No more JavaScript. Okay. So I want to talk about rack 
And I want to talk about what it is, where it came from, and I also want to talk about where we're going with it. And I think it's interesting to talk about this because I believe we have a lot of new Rails developers here in the audience. And a rack is an old technology, and maybe you don't actually know, know much about it or what it is and what it's for. So rack is just a library that defines an interface. So for example, we have a web server here, and we have an application, say our Rails application there. Rack defines the way that those two things talk to each other. So Rack doesn't actually need to be used in your application at all. It's really just defining that, that particular interface. And if the web server and the app server both agree on using this interface, then we can switch them out to whatever we want to. So we can say, ah, oh, I'd like to use this web server today, and then the ETC web server tomorrow. Everyone using ETC in production? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, so the rack interface actually looks something like this. This is, this is kind of an example. Up at the top here, we have a rack application, and at the bottom is just kind of like a test, a test web server, just a fake little web server. You can ignore that part. But basically, the web server will take any request information, it puts it into a hash, and then it passes that, that hash to your application. Your application needs to respond to the method call, and it'll pass the, pass the hash in as a, as a parameter, to, parameter to call, and then, so you get, the, you get the request data here. And then the response data is just a triplet where we return the status and the headers and then some kind of body that we iterate over and print out. Now, I really wanna talk about uh, Rack and HTTP today. I love HTTP, it's really great. It's a stateless protocol. The client doesn't need to know about the server. The server doesn't need to keep track of the client. We just pass these cookies around. We have all these freaking massive hacks on top of headers. It's really, really great and quite easy to use. I also want to talk about Rack and the TCP connection. I, I specifically want to focus on the TCP connection and how it relates to web server, or how it relates to your web server and your application server. So we're going to take a look at the, the timeline of HTTP so we can look at, like, we can understand some of the weird hacks that we've been doing throughout this entire experiment of internet or World Wide Web, hypertext transfer protocol, I guess. Why do I say, I feel like I say HTTP protocol. Do people say that? So it's the hypertext transfer protocol protocol. I can double double. I don't know why I think about this stuff. Anyway, so the dates are along the bottom. Uh, the dates that I chose here are the dates that the RFCs were released for that particular thing. Or in the case of Rack, I just put in the very first commit, or actually, no, that's when it was tagged. The very first release was tagged in 2007. I also added WebSockets in here in 2011. And interestingly, WebSockets are not HTTP. They're not HTTP, but they had a huge impact on uh, Rack and the way that we develop app web applications, so I wanted to put it in this timeline. So we're gonna start off with HTTP 1 and look at the protocol from HTTP 1, and we're gonna go all the way through HTTP 2 and see how Rack developed and what the impact is on the library. So in HTTP 09, yeah, Netscape, woo! I use the same logo through all the slides. I was thinking about, okay, we'll go to Internet Explorer next, and then we'll go to newer browser, but nah, I don't care, sorry. <laughs> So the first thing we do is we create a new TCP connection, we make an HTTP request, and then the server will say like, hey, I'm gonna shell out to some Perl script probably, <laughs> and then return, like the Perl script will print to standard out, and then the HTTP server will grab that standard out, send it, send it back to the client, and we send back the response. So we get a response right there. And when that's done, the browser just tears down the whole TCP connection, the whole thing's done, and then we'll do that process over and over again for all the requests that we need to do. One thing that's interesting is the web server will actually pass information to the CGI script or mod Perl script, whatever, uh, via environment variables. So it would use environment variables. And that's actually why we call this hash thing in Rack the env. So it actually comes from environment variables and how we were passing those parameters to CGI scripts. All right. So we move on to HTTP 1 in 1996. That gets released, and we, we understand, we find out that HTTP 1 has some problems, and that's that connections are expensive. Making that TCP connection is expensive. Uh, so there was kind of an informal, like people started using this informal header, a keep alive header, 
with HTTP 1 to say like, hey, I'd really like you to keep this TCP connection open. The other issue is that we can only do requests in serial, so you have to wait until the request is finished before you can start the next one. So you request all the HTML, once that's all done, then you can say, hey, I would like the next one, please. Wouldn't it be nice if, if we we're downloading this particular HTML file and we we're able to download this GIF in parallel? Because remember, at the time, internet connections were pretty slow. So we would get this HTML and your browser was able to see, oh man, there's, there's like an image right there. I'd really like to download that image. But we can't do it because we have to wait until the HTML is done downloading before we can get that image. So we would like a way to solve that. And we solved that in HTTP 1.1, which was formalized in 1997. And HTTP 1.1 said, hey, we're gonna make sure that all, all connections are keep alive. We're gonna have keep alive connections which I kind of talked about, but this became formalized in 1.1. What this said is like, okay, we're gonna create a new TCP connection, we'll do our HTTP request, we've upgraded to Ruby, yeah, all right? Uh, upgraded to Ruby, where then we'll just do another request and we'll keep this TCP connection alive until we're done. And from the CGI scripts perspective, nothing ever changed, nothing changed. We're still getting our values via the environment variable, still printing the standard out. Everything's exactly the same, but the TCP connection stayed alive. This was really nice. And what was really cool is that the, the apps are, or the, the scripts didn't care. They didn't need to know. The other neat thing is, if you read the HTTP 1.1 uh, RFC carefully, it'll say that browsers are allowed to have two connections. You can have two connections open to the server at a time. What is really funny, though, is at the time, there are many browsers that did not, they did not adhere to this, because if you think about it, it's like, oh, well, if I just open like five connections, then all of a sudden my browser is faster than your browser, even though the RFC you should only, said you should only have two. And also, if you're cool, you could tweak your browser to have even more if you wanted. What was nice about having two connections is that as the, uh, when the browser is downloading that first HTML page, it sees that image, and yes, it had to wait for the HTML to download, but it could use that second connection and say, hey, I'm gonna go download the GIF file now. So it was able to, it was able to get to the download assets in parallel with the HTML. So requests are still serial, but since we have multiple connections open, now we can start downloading things in parallel. However, like we still have this stalling problem where you know, maybe we wanna download some asset, but we can't because we have to wait on one of the other connections to finish up whatever it was doing. So this led to weird workarounds like bundling assets. So we put JavaScript files together. We would, start, uh, we would start putting images into sprites, doing all these weird things so that we get just in order to like, avoid making more requests. Like, that, was, that was what we were doing. We don't wanna make any more requests. Gotta avoid that. 10 years later, Rack 0.1 is released. 10 years, it's wild, 10 years. Rack is based on PEP333. PEP333 is a, a Python specification. It's a specification for a Python library called WSGI, which accomplishes basically the same thing as Rack, but in the Python world. So Rack is kind of a, like, I guess kind of a spiritual port of that to Ruby. Uh, you can think of Rack as essentially an HTTP translation description. It's saying, hey, I'm gonna describe to you, I'm gonna tell you how you should take an HTTP request and convert that into a Ruby data structure, and then I'm gonna tell you how to take the response, the Ruby data structure, and send that back to the client. So it said, hey, I would like you to take, instead of passing things via environment variables, I would like you to use a Ruby hash. Uh, instead of reading from standard out, I would like you to take this triplet and write that back out to the socket. And here's a full, like, here's a full rack application example. That is it, we talked about it a little bit earlier. So after this, after 2007, like that was great. We had Rack, we were able to develop other, other web servers that were compatible. We could switch things out with Rails. I can't remember what was available at the time. We had Passenger, um, what was, Mongrel, yes, yes, thank you, Mongrel. Uh, what else, I feel like there was another one. What? Thin, ah yeah, I knew a T, Thin, thank you, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, after this, in 2011, WebSockets came around, and WebSockets were a huge deal. This is the first time that applications were really able to change their relationship with the website, or with the client. So WebSockets allowed us to do, have bi-directional communication with the client, which is really, really, really interesting. And this is a huge contrast to existing applications. Regular web applications, they would have to process a request, send the response, and you're done. But this WebSocket allowed us to keep, keep some state around. We were able to do stuff back and forth between the client and the server. 
What's interesting, though, is that WebSockets are not HTTP. They're not part of the HTTP spec at all. They're built on top of the HTTP spec. They're a way to upgrade the socket using HTTP. So at the time, we thought, well, you know, it would be really nice. Like, we would like to have Ruby web servers that implement WebSockets. We want that, right? We want WebSockets in Ruby. This is important to us. So in 2013, Rack 1.5 was released, and we had to somehow fit this, uh, fit this WebSocket idea into the existing, the existing API of Rack. So what, what was the solution? Like, how did we do this? The solution was to slap a proc into the env hash. We added three new values. I'm only showing you one of them right here. You can call rack.hijack. You had rack.hijack. If you called call on that, that's a lambda. You call call on that, and it gives you back an IO, an IO, uh, a file descriptor. And you can write stuff to it and read stuff from it. And then when you call close on it, your connection is actually closed with the client. That's kind of weird, though, because like we still had to return a triplet from this lambda, right? So now we're returning something. Isn't this odd? We've ended communication with our client, but still we have to return some triplet. Really weird. So now we've moved on from having Rack being just an HTTP translator to some kind of HTTP translator and socket getter. I'm really keeping our single responsibility here, what we're doing. So let's move on uh, to 2015. So 2015 comes around, HTTP2 is released. HTTP2 is great. And I'm going to start calling it H2 because I'm tired of saying DTP. It's too many things to say. H2 is SSL encouraged. It's not part of the spec. You don't have to use, you technically don't have to use SSL with H2. It's not, you don't have to. But all browsers implement it that way. If you want to use H2, you have to do it over SSL. So practically speaking, SSL is required. A really nice thing about H2 is that it also has compressed headers. So all the headers are compressed. Uh, the other thing is that it's a binary protocol now. So normally, you're able to just connect to an H H1 server. <laughs> and you can issue a request with your terminal. Like, you could type stuff out. Oh, I bet this is going to be fun in post. <laughs> You could type it. You could type stuff out, type stuff out, and actually see a response. You can't do that with H2. It's all done in binary, okay? But it's it's actually a really good thing, and the reason it's done in binary is because H2 allows us to have request and response multiplexing. And here's a here's a silly example. Essentially, we can say like, all right, we're going to create a new. SSL connection, we can send a request to the server, the server, and before the first request is done, we can go ahead and ask, do a second request, too, on the same socket. We don't have to wait. We can just send the request. You can just do it. And you can do it as many times as you want to. And there's no, there's no waiting. There's no overhead. You just make the request. You just do it. And this is why, this is why H2 works so well with these import maps. So winding back to the import maps that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, middle of the presentation. <laughs> we don't have to wait for requests to finish anymore before we make another one. So we can just say, hey, let's just do this. It's fine. We don't have to bundle all this stuff together. But I was thinking about this, and what's really interesting to me about this is that we're saying, we're essentially saying, with Rails 7, by default, we want you to use H2. Like, that is an implicit statement that we're making. And I have to ask, like, the question is, how, like, how do we do this? How do we use H2 in production? So what is the way, what is the way that we use H2 with Rails? Uh, one example, we could use a pure Ruby H2 server, Falcon. It's really great work by Samuel Willems. You should, you should check it out. Really good. Uh, I think that this is the only production-ready H2 server, the only one that I know of. So anyone can shout anything else out. No? Okay. H2, well, H2O is a proxy. We will get to H2O. Uh, or we can run an HTTP2 proxy. Okay? I told you. <laughs> and in fact, wah, H2O. <laughs> yes. We can, do, we can do something like this. We'll have an H2O, we'll have a proxy sitting in front. H2O is an HTTP, 
blah, H2 proxy. It's just a proxy server that sits in front of your, your application server. And I think this is actually a really natural configuration because we're typically running a proxy server in front of our, in front of our web servers today. So it seems fine. We just have this H2 proxy that sits in front of a, uh, it translates essentially H2 and back into H1, and then we make an H1 request to our, our fast web server, and those are sitting, the proxy and the server are sitting very close to each other, so we're able to make those requests very, very, very fast. So this is really great. This is like, these features of H2 are really great, but there's one, there's one feature missing that I haven't touched on at all, and that is uh, push promises. And push promises are an interesting feature of H2 that allow us to do binary, uh, allow us to do bidirectional communication with the client similar to WebSockets. It's different, but I'm not gonna get, it's somewhat different than WebSockets, but I'm not gonna get into the details here exactly. Uh, but these push promises will essentially let us say like, hey, I want you to take this resource. Like the web server's like, I want you to take this. You need this. I'm gonna send you an HTML page. You're gonna need this GIF file. So here, take it. And another example would be like, maybe you put your initial JSON payload, like you might embed an initial JSON payload into your HTML page. Instead of doing that, you can, you can just say like, well, I know that you're gonna make this you're gonna make this uh, JS request later. You're gonna make this request for JSON later, so just take this payload as well. I know you're gonna make this request. But one problem is like, okay, let's say you have to send down some CSS. You're like, okay, I'm sending you the web page. You're gonna need our style, our CSS, so I'm gonna send that to you. But the problem is like, what if the client already has that CSS cached? It's an interesting problem. Uh, they either, the client either has to go ahead and download that CSS that you told them that they need, or they need to take the time to reject it, which is kind of interesting. So it is possible that you could use these push promises incorrectly, and now, like, now your responses are actually slower because you have to do more work. Now, push promises are actually available in HTTP 1.1. Uh, they're available via the status code 103 and early hint status code. Now, no browsers actually support this status code, but H2 proxies do. So if you send a response, something like this, with a, with a 103 early hints header at the beginning, the proxy can actually interpret that and send a push promise down to your client. So for example, you have a setup like this, uh, maybe you, you return this H2 TDP 103 response, you say, hey, I want you to send these push, like, I want you to send these down to the client. H2 will go ahead and take those, convert them into H2 push promises, and send them down, send them down to your client. Uh, if you're running Rails with Puma or Falcon, you can actually enable this, like, this is enabled by default, and maybe enabled by configuration in Rails, so you can say, like, hey, I want you to push down assets as well. Uh, these, both of these web servers support it via an experimental Rack API. Now we're gonna get back to Rack for a second. So what is this experimental Rack API? Let's think back on to WebSockets. Well, we decided to slap another Lambda into the end hash. <laughs> That's right. So we just added another key there. It's got a lambda and you call call on it and you pass some stuff in. If you know that that key is there, it'll do, it'll do the push promises for you. So we, had, we added another lambda to the end hash. So HTTP, let's move on, HTTP 3 came out in 2020, but I'm, not, I'm just gonna skip over this. Uh, from what I'm reading the spec, it's actually not a big deal for us. Basically the main change is that we're gonna start using UDP instead of TCP, so our relationship with the TCP connection is just gone. It's, just, it's UDP now, don't worry about it. <laughs> Did they get the joke? I don't know. <laughs> it's UDP. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so, <laughs> my dumb jokes. All right, so Rails 7, Rails 7, even though it's not saying this in the release notes, it's saying we want you to use H2 by default, right? We, we have this new default, and it works really, really well with H2. We want you to use H2 by default. But I have to ask, like, are, do, do we need H2 servers? So the fact that most of these H2, these H2 features are available to us via, pro, via a proxy makes me wonder whether or not we actually need to have an H2 server written in Ruby at all. Do we actually need this technology? So I, I feel like if we're doing agile, like agile development, you, know, you don't actually write something until you actually need it, so you gotta wonder, do we need this? 
I think maybe we do need it in some circumstances. Like in some places you can't run proxies, but you want to have H2. So it does, I mean, it does make sense to me that we have, we have pure Ruby H2 servers. But then, like, the question is, if we want to have pure H2 servers, like, how do we standardize this with a rack? Like, do we need to make any API changes to rack? The other question I have is, like, what does H2 mean for hijack? So if you remember, we were looking at hijack as a way to support WebSockets, and we call call on this special thing. Man, I hate that API. It's like, well, if you just call call on it. It's so descriptive, you just call call. <laughs> Maybe it'll call back, oh, sorry, all right. Anyway, <laughs> so what does this mean? What does this mean for hijack? Hijack is supposed to give us back some, some type of socket, but we saw that H2, it, re, it uses the same socket for all requests and responses, so what does that mean in the context of H2? Do we have to write some kind of proxy that, that, that uh, looks like an IO, and we can perform the same thing over an H2 connection? Do we have to emulate something? Do we just not support it? Like, what do we do? The other problem is that it seems like slapping lambdas into a hash is, it's kind of, to me, it's unsustainable. Like, I don't think that this, I don't think this is the right way to add new features to a library. Like, I would not do this in any other, in any other circumstance. Like, I, I'm sure many of you have worked on applications where people are just passing hashes around with junk in them, and you're like, man, what is in this junk? I don't want to do this. So I don't think that this is the right way, I don't think that this is the right way to be developing Rack. So I want to talk about the next generation of, the next generation of Rack. We need a next generation of Rack and we need it for a next generation of Ruby application servers. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what this looks like at all, but the good news is this is a keynote, so I don't have to have solutions. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't, I don't have any good solutions right now, but I do have some, like, I do have some, some guidelines or, you know, some, some, some rails. <laughs> yeah, I want to make sure you're awake. <laughs> that we should stay inside. First off, it should be easy to use. It has to be easy to use. Rack may have some problems, but the fact that you can write a whole app server in just three lines of Ruby code, that's huge, and we need to keep that. That's very important. I want, I want new developers to be like, yes, I can write a whole web app in just three lines and do it. It's awesome. We need to keep that. It has to be easy to extend. Like, I don't think that putting, I mean, yes, slapping new keys into a hash is indeed easy to extend. That is technically true. <laughs> But I think we need a, we need a better way. Uh, the other thing, the final thing, is it has to be easy to deploy. If it's not easy to deploy, nobody, nobody's gonna use it, and if nobody uses it, then what is the point of all of this? <laughs> Sorry to get all dark on you in the last <laughs> minute. All right, I wanna end this here. I can't believe this, I'm like not rushing to the end. I should have delayed more before. <laughs> all right, so I wanna <laughs> I want to mention one more thing before I quit today. Uh, this, this entire talk may actually be a moot point, okay? We have, we have kind, of, kind of an existential crisis right, going on right now. I don't know whether or not you know this. But the fact, the fact of the matter is that Ruby 3.1, Ruby 3.1 shipped with WASM support, okay? This is a huge deal. Uh, if, go check out this website, rubysyntax3.github.io. Uh, one of my coworkers wrote it. Kevin Newton wrote this, wrote this website. It's really, really amazing. If you go there, if you go there, you, you are going to see an example of Ruby executing natively in your browser, okay? Like, it's running Ruby right in your browser because of WASM. So what this means is that next year, we very well could be running Rails in the browser and React on the server. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. See you next year. <laughs>